closing comments. Uh, Universal can mean many things, but we are in Waseda University, so it should be Jun Murakami style Universal invariants coming from UQSL2 and such, such things. I actually learned this from Otsuki's book. He has a very nice account of this. You start with a ribbon hop algebra and then you can make universal invariant. I realize this is not as universal as you get. Um, you can do much more universal by forgetting about the Lie algebra or the ribbon hop algebra and just work with diagrams. But here I want to do concrete computations and well, algebras are use useful for have, have doing concrete computations. So that's, this is only half universal. And so what does it do? Um, it will produce a computable generalization. Of the Alexander polynomial. And so in some sense for not, a, not for not theory, the Alexander polynomial is a foundation of many things. I think Hitoshi Murakami once told me it's the, the seed from which many quantum invariants grow. Do you remember? Um, quote from 2007. Um, but anyway, um, I want to grow this seed and, and, and show you how, how you get something slightly more interesting that's towards the Jones polynomial, but definitely not the whole Jones polynomial. And this is joint work. With Laura Barnaton. But I must say, most of the ideas are his. He was already studying this kind of quotients before I was born, I think. But so the mistakes are mine. I can hear that. Yes. So there was pre Jones, but uh, this is on camera, so I, I rather not go into it. <laughs> I was born before the Jones polynomial, but not mm -hmm. very much. So anyway, um, so what is the plan? So I want to make a little outline plan of my talk. Well, for, for the first part of the plan is to make a handout. Um, so I want to ask: Does everybody have a, have a handout? Otherwise, there should be. There, there are more on both sides of the. And there are also more here. I'll make something. Mm -hmm. But so the, the point of the handout is that it's hard to read, but maybe if I got you interested during the talk, then you can look at some details that I will fail to write or will just not write correctly. Hopefully, the handout is correct. Um, but the handout also co contains a reference at the very end to another handout by drawer that is, I think, twice as big and twice as colorful because he, had a f he gave a four-hour talk and I'm only giving a one-hour talk if I do well. Okay. So if you feel anything is unclear, then this is also definitely a place to look. But so what is my plan? I want to first uh, consider an algebra Algebras really DN related to UQ. This is maybe the for now the, for this for the purpose of this talk. This is the foundation. This is where things start. Um, but of course, you could dig deeper and ask where does this algebra come from. Um, but for, for the interest of time, I'm just writing down the commutation relations here. But it is essential for building up this universal invariant. So after that, I will build up. And Tom, I think you're missing a handout. Is this correct? No, it's ah. You're just waiting for me to say something interesting. <laughs> okay. Anybody else need a handout? There are still many left. So I will talk about this universal invariant, and um, then I will focus on the simplest case um, using <coughs> these n normally ordered exponentials. So here 
side. So that's a very simple thing, right? Computing the so the goal of this talk in some sense is to compute the Alexander polynomial of the trefoil. Well, everybody can do that, um, but the point is to do it in an interesting way that generalizes and also illustrates what what you would do in general. Any questions so far? Okay, so I'm going to pass to the first line of the handout, which, which reads the algebra. And this is important enough that I want to, even though everybody has it on the handout, I want to write it down because I'm excited about this algebra. So it's a sequence of algebras, dn. So for n, for n in n, the natural numbers start with one, I suppose. Um, dn is an algebra over Q, and now comes the interesting part, Q epsilon. This is Q polynomials in epsilon that's square to, not square, sorry, nth power is zero. So this thing, maybe I can abbreviate to Q epsilon. That there should be an N in there, yes? But it doesn't do that in epsilon, it an N. That's absolutely right. Um, I, may, I may still write the epsilon because I did it in my, my handout, but it was late last night. So <laughs> I, I completely agree with you. Just trying to show that I got one. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, but at least well, this is the uh, this is the ring we're working over, and so in some sense the only novelty is here that, that we have some nil potency, and we introduce some nil potency in the computations we do with UQ and so on, or really UQ GLT. So let me write down the generators. So this is algebra over this ring, uh, generated by. So I'm not using this the standard letters, uh, but maybe this this should be E F K H or so. But well, I'm I'm sort of used to these letters. So these are three uh, four generators, and uh, satisfying. Commutation relations that you should recognize. Maybe the first one is not so easy to recognize. This is the most interesting one. That's why it comes first. And notice the epsilon, but for now maybe set epsilon to one. So you then you would get the, the usual. It's not defined. It's zero. What's B? B, B, B. Up. Oh. In the handout there is also B. A capital B. Capital B. My apologies. I, I keep switching between capital B. So, so in the handout, the small b is a capital B. Thank you very much. And later I will switch back to my lowercase b, but I did this too many times. So please tell me if there are more glitches. But I hope the, the next one at least is clear. So many people prefer a 2 here, and this is the relation for the Borel the upper upper borel in SL2 is two-dimensional Lie algebra it's not beautiful. so this is maybe the most important relation here and all the rest comes from making a quantum double construction so we have WC we have WB this is capital B and it does exactly the same thing but with an epsilon so that's mildly interesting and UC it's the same thing, this is the other Borel, so it is minus U and U capital B equals epsilon. So in some sense the capital letters here are for the dual or for the lower Borel and the lowercase letters are for the upper. And so this, this is really doubling, doubling this little algebra here. Um, with respect to this extra nilpotent element, epsilon. So you, you need some completion to exponentiate. I agree. Yeah. I need some clock. And um, you, you can see in, in the handout there's some little hat here and there. Um, <laughs> I will ignore it for the sake of argument, but in, in the, we, we need some completion. So H adding completion just in, as in uh, UQSL2. 
So I would introduce a parameter h in equating. Yeah. No, but this is a good point. I'm glossing over this. Um, so I'm writing. I'm going to write down many so infinite so sums so that are. So you use the algebraic uh, nature of your theory. I would like to, but really, I. I think right here I'm just being sloppy and I'm I'm hiding the the grading and the the edge added completion. But I agree. It it would be nice to to take the dual and, and work algebraically. This is definitely definitely worth doing. But here, I, I just want to make the point that this looks like UQSO2, except um, here, usually you have another de a denominator, something like Q minus Q inverse, and then this is N B equals C. And you see there, there is the there is a central element. And this is small b, b equals capital B minus epsilon C, if I don't Get it wrong. Yes. So this is a central element. That's easy to see because you, you see at the C and B do exactly the same thing except for an epsilon. So if I put the epsilon here, then this will make all the computation relations vanish. So this is a central element right here. And in the construction of UQSO2, as as usual, you would this 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 represents the double Cartan and so this this gets quotiented out. Minus it on you in the last line if you want that to be central. Thank you. Yeah, because I I, I did say that they should act the same except did the handle of it right? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Maybe I shouldn't have written anything. I just told you about the handle. But in some sense, it's it's nice to see them appear here. So it's a relatively simple algebra, and I want to pay a, a special attention to uh, we focus. This is n equals zero. Oh, sorry, not n equals zero. N equals one. N equals one, which means epsilon is equal to zero. So we get some particularly simple algebra. And n equals one. Sorry, n equals two. Oh, this is epsilon squared equals zero. Um, so th these are the two cases I want to focus on. And so this one will produce. And this one will produce something new. But it's hard to say new, the word new in mathematics. Nothing is new in mathematics. But, but what is the whole algebra structure here? Um, that's a good point. I did, I did write one, one thing in the handout. Um, so it's, this is a quantum double construction, right? So dn, d stands for double. So dn is the quantum double. WC, so the universal enveloping algebra. This is not U, this is universal enveloping algebra. WC. So of the oh, U, U is but now with. So U is the universal? Yes, so so this, is, this is an algebra. algebra, this is a Lie algebra. It's, it's, it's written that it's the universal algebra. The opposing algebra of U is a little confusing. It is very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's a calligraphic U. Um, and <laughs> in, in a moment, the. Uh, <laughs> But do, you, do you use the standard uh, structure? Not quite. So what I wrote in the handout was that I, I, I took the bi-algebra structure, which is um, sending uh, W to epsilon. So it's epsilon times the standard bi-algebra structure. And which co-product goes to? I think the, the rest is fixed. If, if I have this and that. Then I think the rest is fixed by, by, by asking for duality. So I want them to be dual. But what is the co-product finally? Ah, OK, yes. I did not write that down. Uh, so the co-product for W is interesting. For C is not so interesting. And so for W it is. So the trivial one would be this. But instead I put E to the Epsilon B, I think. Well, it should, it should be related to this, so I think Epsilon C. Yes, Epsilon C should be. 
And so again, this, this is this is the pretty much the standard quantization of the if if you remove the epsilon. Sorry, in, in your paper with Rashi Tikin from 2004, you write down a quantization for making UQ GL2, and so this is very similar. It's just I, I made it slightly asymmetric, but this is this is not big too. So I'm not trying to do something radical, I'm just introducing this epsilon, that's all. And this epsilon is going to cut the quantum invariance down to size, so we can do some more computations for more knots. Maybe so not just so 70. It, is it, it looks like uh, Jordanian uh, information of... Uh, Maybe, we should talk about it, I don't know. I, I, I don't know all the deformations, there seem to be so many, so yeah. So in, in this sense it may not be new at all, but it's new to me. And like to tell you about it. Well, I don't know yet. There is a, there's a little footnote saying there's a footnote that there are expectations and that and nothing new is under the sun. And C is a group like? Um, yes, C is group like. I did not write it. Yes, so, so we, we start with the standard quantization of the of the universal enveloping algebra of the two-dimensional piece. And then we make this quantum double, keeping tra track of epsilon and forgetting about the H adic H adic topology. I apologize. Sorry, which was the So which is the diagonal arch? C. C is the... So this must be, yeah, this is maybe E H. That's maybe better terminology. So E is W. Yes. Uh, um, no, no, no. It's it's not. It's it's Lie algebra. Like it's not group like. Right. So, so yeah. It's primitive. More questions? This is an important point, and so I would be very happy if somebody could tell me more about this algebra and maybe its representation theory. Um, I was not so lucky with the representation theory so far, but maybe I wasn't looking for it either. Um, I, wa I was focusing on this universal invariance, and that's what I want to talk about next. Uh, yeah, what, what is B? U is F. U, U corresponds to F. Yeah, so B, B is the double, double Cartan. So we have two. We have H and A, maybe H prime. Ah. And then portioning out the central element would, would be setting them equal to each other. So we get too much and we quotient out. And so I, I said I, I would like to focus on the cases n equals 1 and 2. But maybe zero is also interesting, right? Or infinity, I don't know how to say it, but I, I mean the case where you have no where epsilon equals zero. Uh, sorry, epsilon equals one, and so we're doing the, the standard, pretty much the standard thing. Just rescale a bit. And so um, what was mentioned by Stavros about this two loop, and maybe the Melvin Morton Rosansky that is in the in my, my little footnote. These are expectations that could be motivated from saying, well. We're doing some UQS or two invariants. So it definitely, in, in that sense, it's, it's an a sequence of approximations to color jumps polynomials. And in that sense, also to the foreign conjecture, maybe, but maybe not. Because roots of unity are not so clear from this point of view. Okay, so I, I want to briefly introduce these uh, universal invariants, but before I do that, I should write down the R matrix. This for any note? I, I wrote a program, so if you go to the very last part of the handout, the program has a Greek name, it's Niob, and it computes uh, from a braid presentation, and so I computed for 20 crossing braids. And so it, it, it seems interesting, but um, it's been maybe too early to say much, but I can say that it, 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 it definitely sees mirror images, so it's definitely stronger than Alexander is. It can so the, the left-hand trefoil and the right-hand trefoil get 
get distinguished. Sorry, is it exactly that uh, you refer to double or borel? Yes. Or What's the epsilon? Mm. I mean, the it's just over a different uh, algebra of a different ring. But for, for I'm, I'm doing something very standard here. Um, my letters are a bit off, and I apologize for that. These are Doris levels, so it's his fault. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to do something very standard here. There are also other ways of getting to the same to the same algebra, but I, I was trying to connect it to the world of Grinfeld. And so, in the world of Grinfeld, if you have a quantum double, then you get an R matrix for free. So it it, it looks very nice as far as R matrices go. This is also on the handout. So and again, this is a divergent sum, maybe, if you're not careful about the completion, completion of the tensor product. Um, but in the interest of time and letters, chalk. I'm not going to write many H's that, that don't belong. So and, and the, the way this is made is just from taking the co-pairing or the, the canonical element in the tensor product. So C, W, J. So this is the R matrix. There's also the inverse of the R matrix, but I don't want to focus on it right now. It looks very simple. And these uh, brackets are my brackets are asymmetric. I suppose because my co-product I started with is asymmetric. So these are Gaussian Gaussian Q numbers, not the symmetric ones. And so if, if I tell you this, then so it's just a geometric series. Of then I take the factor. So it's infinite dimension. <laughs> yes, and, and so the invariant will be polynomials in B in this central element. That, that's how, how finite things are. And finite things are coming out of infinite dimensional objects because of these ordered exponentials. So I'm going to rewrite all these infinite sums as exponentials and I'm, I'm just going to look at the exponents and the constant terms. And th these are nice algebraic objects. So that, that's how, because this doesn't look very promising if you're start you start calculating all this. Is, I mean, it looks okay, but now you have 10 R matrices and you get a big mess. So let's make a big, big mess. And let's do, a, let's do the trefoil from this thing. So there is a, there's a caveat here in, um, this is unfinished work, so, so far. Universal. Invariant. Zn, so this does depend on n, so it comes from dn. Um, defined below. Only works. So there is an issue that that's why I make the trefoil as a one-one tangle. So I'm not supposed to make uh, closures because closures will, at least in this way of looking at things, they will cause some trouble and I haven't thought about it yet. There's probably some way of resolving this, but so far. If you want to talk about knots, you can always pre present them as a one-one tangle or a long knot. And so then, um, no, no closed components are okay, but of course if, if we want to talk about links, maybe skein relations, then it would be nice to have closed components. Okay, um, so I wrote down in words what we should do uh, to, to make this universal invariant. Um, so what you do is you write down C N find Y. Yes. 
one arm matrix for each crossing. Yes? So, when, when did you modify it? So, you, did you modify Boel with E and take quantum double or co so, so quantum this, double and modify? So, Borel is, is, is the same, but it, it starts happening at the, if we make the Borel into a leap by algebra. So it's the it's the leap it's the bracket on the dual, and then also the the co-product. If we quantize that, that's where epsilon comes. So it, it breaks the symmetry. In. <laughs> Good question. Um, so I, I I suppose this is a bit standard, but I I find it hard to express it well. So if somebody knows how to explain it better, I would be very interested. But so my way of explaining is. Um, we take an R matrix for each crossing, and I'm just going to do it right here. So we have three crossings. They're all positive, so that's nice. So I don't have to worry about the R inverse here. But of course, but if you had a net... the existence of R matrix is non-trivial, then... So you need to prove this is R matrix. Can you repeat your question? Uh, so if uh, you take the refer to double with something, then you can have R matrix. But is this true? So if you broke the... Symmetry, right? In the definition of the n, so is it the uh, so the fact this is a matrix is hollow, or it is it's non-trivial fact? I think it fo follows over any ring, so it, it, the exact same proof still works. Yeah. And in some sense, it's by definition, right? The, the the quantum double is is the algebra such that this thing the 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 uh, canonical element I is the, the is the solving Yang Baxter. So this so. is the double of yes. something. Yes, yes, yes. It, it, it's really the drift of double. It's, it's, it's no more. It, it's just that there is something hiding in Q. Maybe I should say what is Q. I did I did not say that. Um, so Q is my shortcut for e to the epsilon. This, this is I'm sorry for forgetting about that. But that's kind of important. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. You did say. Well, I want to say it again because it's very nice. Because then all these these silly Q factorials and Q things they then they get cut down to very simple objects. So, for example, when n equals one, then Q Q is just one, and when n equals two, then uh, Q is just uh, one plus epsilon. Right. So, powers of one plus epsilon is very simple. So then you can still do Q, Q calculus, but it will sort of be a mix of hypergeometric Q and Q, Q hypergeometric functions. Then it's a, it's a nice mix, but it's much much simpler than than the full Q. And well, I, I don't know of a, of a general theory of such hypergeometric functions, but I would be interested to hear if somebody knows. Okay, so I, I want to. Um, just give an example. I think the, this universal invariant is best explained by an example. And so remember, no closed components. And the universal invariant from D is called Z. Okay. So how do we make Z n here? Well, I take um, three R matrices, and we need to keep track of the of the because I'm going to make many many summations it will be a six-fold sum so it's good to have some uh, labeling of the some labeling of the knot so let me label it one uh, I don't know one two three so I'm doing the lower part four five six so what's really happening here maybe is that I'm cutting I'm cutting it into pieces, right? And now I'm just going to write down this sum three times. And I'm not sure that was a good idea. Uh, so maybe I, I can say, say, it, say something before I do that. So um, it's defined by taking the R matrix for each crossing and then multiply, then multiply. You don't have to add some extra element for uh, maximal or minimal. I do, and I wrote it down, but I, I didn't. I wrote it down, in the, it's the very last part of the. So, cup and cap get uh, this e to the b plus epsilon c. Okay. 
yeah, sort of coming from the dream felt that you're absolutely right. I'm just trying to hide. Um, so, so maybe you can just do it and you can, you can try to follow if I get it right. Um, so I multiply along the components, um, but the important thing is taking taking uh, the first, first um, tensor factor. Over crossing. Then push it up. Okay, so I'll, I'll just do it briefly. So we start at one. At one, and this is the over crossing, so I'm going to write down the first tensor factor. So the first tensor factor is U, J, and maybe I should put J1. So it's clear that I'm doing J1. B, uh, I1. So now I'm here. And then I'm at 4, and this is the undercrossing. So I'm taking the second tensor factor. But this is uh, B4. So I take C, I4, J4. This is going to be a summation over J1, I1, and here I made the choice I4. Would have been nicer to do I, I3, I think. So we label by the, um, by the overs. And there will also be I5, J5. And this, this doesn't look very promising, and maybe I should not um, continue this whole but let me do one more term. Here we get 5 and it's the overcrossing. So here I get u, j, 5, b, i, 5. Oh, it's kind of fun. Um, as June remarked, I, I should consider cups and caps, but I'm, in the interest of time, I'm going to ignore them. Um, and here I get 2, which is the undercrossing. So I get g, c, i, 1. W, J, one. Ah, we're almost there. Two, three, three is the overcrossing. So I get U, J, three, B, J, three. Am I still okay? Three and six is the last one, so why not do it? Uh, six, and I, I label by five, which is the overcrossing. J, five. Great, so we have a six-fold infinite sum, um, and this is computable. Divided by all these factorials. Thank you, yes. And some of them are quantum, and some of them, the eyes are, the eyes are usual. And the j's are quantum. Okay, so this, this I think is well known that you can always write such universal invariants, and this is where often the discussion stops, at least where um, I usually get discouraged. Why do you need tensor product in this uh, Because it's a long knot, so everything gets connected. Oh. So I'm contracting every time. Oh, yeah, and, and this, this is maybe the cups and caps I was hiding. These this, are this, yeah, all contractions. But also connecting this piece of the R matrix to this piece of the R matrix contract. But so in general, if I, I if I would have a tangle, any then I would get as many tensor factors as the number of components. So the so usual Z n of t, where t is not a trefoil but some tangle. I'm, I'm not, this is tangle. This is tangle. Well, yes, in some sense, yeah, thank you. This is the end. This is the end of the trefoil, right? So to get an actual physical grant, you, you have to use the relations in the algebra and simplify it. Yes. That you have a, a canonical basis for the algebra. Well, that, that's exactly where, where we're going, yes. Otherwise, it's kind of useless. That, that was my point. <laughs> my point was that this, this is useless, and even, even making, the, making a PBW-type basis is still not so promising, maybe. 
um, but it's already much better. And so the only improvement I want to make on MATLAB is to write it as exponentials. But so to answer the other question, so in general, this is. Right, so the, the Zn of tango is takes values in the, in the algebra tensor itself with as many tensor factors as the number of components. Sorry. Yes? Unless you get to the center or something, or degree zero, it's not an invariant. It's a not invariant. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there was a problem. <laughs> Um, so, I, th I think your point is the same as Don's point, that I, I should um, use the relations in the algebra to bring this into some canonical form. No, it's only a piece of that. Maybe the degree zero piece after you use the relations. Well, you're, you're, you're free to, to consider the degree zero piece, but I want to consider all pieces right now. No, but he, he, if you seem to claim different things, he's saying the full thing is not invariant, you're saying it is. And you know it is or it is. Yes, and I'm, I'm, I'm of the opinion that it is an invariant, but I'm happy to discuss this later, and so I, I, I want to um, continue discussion. Um, so um, I, I want to move on to indeed bringing this in normal form, and so hopefully convincing you that this is a this is a not invariant. But um, well, we, we will see. Um, so I want to go to uh, normally okay, so, so you know the center of the algebra, right? I know it exists. I don't, don't know quite what it is in this case. I have not considered Because the all not invariants will be central. Yeah. Yes, central if you have no <coughs> yes. Yes, so it, w it would be nice to, to express the center, but I, I have no clear exp expression for this. Yeah, this is definitely something I'm, I'm looking for. Um, so this no normally ordered exponentials is just an elaboration of taking a PPW basis, right? So for idea number one is um, order. And to make ordering a bit uh, more pleasant, I'm going to change my basis. So instead of the big B, I use B because uh, I already wrote it. This, this central element, so I want to pass to that because then we have one, one less variable to order. So I'm going to change the basis when getting rid of the big B. And actually, um, I'm going to also work over the ring Q. So I will write Qn, but in the handout it's Q epsilon. But, um, but so I, w I want to take power series in, in this central element B. And so I'm going to change the algebra on you. This, this, this simplifies matters. Um, it's not essential, but um, it, it's, it's nice. And it's a it is essential for getting something uh, polynomial size. So that, that's the idea number one, and I, I think this is pretty standard. Um, for two, um, this is to consider to write every as a perturbed order exponential. And so before I'm writing the down general statements, maybe we should consider example this will be non-perturbed. But let, let's consider uh, n equals one. And let's look, see what the R matrix really looks like for n equals 1. Uh, well, it looks exactly like this, except when n equals 1, then I get usual factorials. So 
so that's a bit nicer. Um, so it's this thing, but I, I insist to write this as, and I, I, so far this doesn't quite make sense, but I still insist to write it like so. Um, this is not equal, right? This is this is not equal, and that's the whole point of ordered exponentials. So I want to make a theory of um, expressions for which. So this is not equal to that. So we you change that to two people. I apologize. I, I was trying to. I was trying to gloss off of that. But in, indeed, um, I should have written. This is still the big U, not the universe of developing algebra. But here, uh, so little b. So big B is little b plus epsilon c. Thank you for catching that. I J. So now, now I did make the transformation. Big B to the I gets small b plus epsilon c to the I. Yes. But if n equals one. N equals one. Yes. So epsilon equals zero. Oh, that's so true. You can be b. That's yeah. true. Epsilon is one here. So you were oh. right. <laughs> Thank you. Right. And Good point. Good point. And, and so my, my point about these uh, ordered exponentials is that even though it's, it's not of this form, it's, n it's not a pure exponential, I still want to um, use this imagery um, and I, I want to make a notation so that things that are not true become true. Right, so, th so this is a motivation for defining this object O of some power series that does uh, model things like this, but has ha it, it, it has a, it has this ordering, the alphabetic ordering built in. But the right hand side is in the end, but the end things are two, right? What, what do you mean? Ah, yes, yes, so, so, so this is definitely not, this is definitely not equal, it's not even in the same space, as you said. Um, but so the, the point of the, um, this thing, I haven't defined yet, but I'm going to define, is that this will be an object where this, this, this is just a commutative um, power series in some variables, and maybe I can give the variables names uh, 1, 1, 2, 2. Now it becomes a little bit clearer, and now the, the definition basically is to take this commutative power series and then order the things that have subscript, B, uh, subscript 1, order them on the first tensor factor, and subscript 2 on the second tensor factor. And so it, it, it's just a way of writing complicated sums and sort of avoiding this mess from the very start. So I owe you an exact definition of, of this O thing. And this was one reason for making the handout, because it's, it's, it's kind of complicated. Uh, but let, let, let's go through it and see if it makes more sense than what's written here. I, I agree this doesn't make sense. This was for motivation. Well, the, the, the O is a computer thing now. Is that, is that what you said? Yes, yes, yes. And I, I will be... I surely that's just true for any operator at all. I mean, this, this thing will not only depend... No, no, no. So, so, so there, there is some... This is not an operator. This is my, my own device for what I call ordered exponential. Um, so. Maybe the brackets should not be taken as O of something, okay. but it's uh, this is an ordering of, of the, so we have many terms here, it's a power series, and I'm going to take the power series and, and take all the variables and put them put them by hand on, on tensor factors. It's similar to usual the normal ordering in... Yes, I think so, yeah. I mean, that, yeah, that, that was the reason for it. I'm not even naming it. So. So we are using uh, yes. columns. Well, both sides easier. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that's a good thing. Um, so, uh, so we're sort of halfway the first page of the handout. Uh, so th this this is where the definition. So this is definition. O of f. And because things are linear, I, I will start with for f a monomial. Then if we know how to order monomials, then we can order sums of monomials and maybe power series. So I want to um, define f first. f is a 
monomial in some commuting variables. Uh, so f is product over some set s in big S. So s is some fixed set that comes from the components of the of the tangle. So s is a set, finite set. And here we get uh, c u w u w and Maybe I should have done multi indices, but I didn't. So this is all written in the handout with this big product. And here we get some uh, exponents ks, ls, ls. I see I forgot the coefficient. Of course, the monomials are allowed to have coefficients, but again, this is a linear, linear story. This is not going to affect any, anything about the ordering. So I, I, I do not have coefficients. So linear over this new basic. Linear, linear over the yes, yes, the new base ring. Although I could have, this is just because I, I, KLM is something nice, KLMN is not something nice, but I could have definitely have, I, I could have avoided this B and just worked with the big B and done the same thing with four variables. It would have done the same thing. Yeah, no, it, 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 seemed, it seemed nice to do it. Yes. But it's sort of arbitrary. Okay, so, so we have this thing and now define. Um, So it's O of f, but it's not operator O applied to monomial f. But it's this is something new and it's something non commutative that lives in. It should live in d n to the tensor power s, so the cardinality of the set, and it is defined as a tensor product s and s. Um, well, of some thing I called f sub s. Not sure why. And f sub s is, is just, so maybe I can just write it right away. It, it's, it's just c to the ks. So notice that the lower the subscript vanished, and that's the only thing that happened here. M s. You see, so it's, it's exactly the same thing as the monomial, except the subscripts have vanished, and instead of the subscript, I'm taking a tensor product. So this is definitely in, in this tensor product of d n. And I, I, I suppose this happens a lot in this kind of algebra also when, when you write R12 or so, that 1 and 2 also usually refer to the tensor slots. I just wanted to have a nice uh, definition that is hopefully correct. And so this generalizes. So this is a way of making some um, commutative start and then making something non-commutative out of it in the standard order. And of course, we could have different or have different orders and different O's. But I I like alphabetically ordering things. Um, okay, so this generalizes, and so here is an example. And so this is in the spirit of this, but I can do slightly better. So this n equals two. But if you want to see n equals 1, you just set epsilon to 0. Um, so r, you can check and you should check. This is O, this is also on the handout. But this is what I mean by a perturbed exponential, ordered exponential. So it's 1 plus and then epsilon times, this is the perturbation, uh, c i, c j. Or oh, this is r i j. Uh, C J U I for U J, and it looks a bit awkward, but this is because of the quantum the quantum factorial that has been changed into a usual factorial. This this gives this last term. So this is the perturbation, and then we get the quadratic form B C J. Oh, that's unfortunate. Let me write Q for quadratic form. Q equals B C J. And this is actually linear because P is in my ground field or in my ground ring. Um, but the quadratic part is this. 
So th this is the this is exponential of q. This is the end of the bracket. So this is the O of something commutative. And if I take the O of this commutative thing, I get something in uh, so this lives in in d two and was two tensor d two. But, but n if it was the same label. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. but inside here they do. Um, but when I put them on the, then then the labels are actually actually vanish. So, but but the, yes, the answer is. Uh, so you put both sheets to the left. That's yeah. Yeah. Alphabetically ordering things. Yeah, it, it's it's a slightly awkward thing, but it, computationally, I, I I found it useful to to work with this commutative object here and then keep the sort of keep the ordering apart. So in some sense, this this example is all you need to know and, and sort of all I have to say. Because you see, if, if you have the R matrix written like this, um, then it, it's conceivable at least that if you combine R matrices in the fashion we did for the figure eight, uh, for the truffle knot, that you will stay in this, this space of perturbed, or, uh, perturbed ordered exponentials. And so that, that's the point of theorem one at the very bottom of the handout, is that indeed for n equals two, for any tangle, it will have roughly this form. So you can write this invariant Zn in a standard canonical form. But, sorry. The, the commutative algebra is much, much smaller than the non-commutative algebra. The non I agree. Oh, no, it's not. No. Well, so it's not, because all the commutators are in So in a sense, it's the same size. I'm not sure what you mean by size. Well, if you take the graded dimensions, for instance, are they equal? But I guess they are equal because all your commutators in some order yes. are smaller or not smaller? Well, I haven't considered this question, so I, well, I, I should think it about it. really make sense because unless O is an isomorphism, but, but so this you can't write everything I, as O. No, 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 so. you cannot. But, but so we start from something that you can, and then, and then the content of theorem one is that you stay in this very nice little garden, so you don't go outside. So there are definitely ob objects in D2, tensor D2, that cannot be written as this perturbed thing. Um, but we, we just get lucky, I think. There may be a deeper reason for why we stay in this space. If O is injected, then you can just drop the O to find the invariant of the commutative algebra, which is your thing to work with. Yeah. Maybe so, yeah. You can just drop the O completely and say the invariant you're interested in is the thing that your original thing was the O of. And then you just I think that's, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, drop the O. It, it will fly. I would get more confused, but indeed it will, in, at some point it will be less confusing, I hope. So I, I made some statement here uh, about, so this is theorem one, is that uh, for any T, for any tangle T, it's O of 1 plus epsilon P. This is the perturbation. This is the Alexander polynomial of the tangle delta. Delta, or it's just the Laurent polynomial maybe for now. Um, times E to the Q, where P quartic in and they're also balanced in some sense but the, the general feature is that they're quartic so quartic in the sense that I forgot a square here so here you get u i squared w j squared. So that's what I mean by quartic. And so and delta is in q. It, well, morally it should be in power series in b, but it's actually a Laurent polynomial in uh, t, where t equals e to b. So we get another bonus that. Um, we get to work for Laurent polynomials, and so this, this is the 
this is the Alexander polynomial, it turns out. I had planned to do the, to do the trifle amount example um, explicitly on the board, but I think I would need at least 15 minutes for that. I don't have that, so I'm, I'm happy to show it to you later. Um, but I, I will now just invite you to turn the page and look at the, look at the ugly side of things. Because you may wonder, um, okay, this is great, why, why not do 3 or do 4 or do n or do everything, but maybe do uqsl2, maybe it's true for uqsl2. But there's something uh, nasty here, uh, at least uh, nasty or beautiful, I don't know. But this is at the top, uh, at the bottom of the page, it's called I call it Nogos. And it, it's this uh, five line, one, two, three, four, five, five line polynomial in many variables. And, and Nogos means it's the, it's the order of the universe. And so this, this is what makes it work. This is the scaling relation in some sense. And, and this is, at, at the same time, this is, I'm claiming this is simpler than the scaling relation, but it's also much worse. And I think it can be simplified, but I, I haven't understood it right. Um, but what, what it is, is this, this is a way of, this is all you need to commute these uh, ordered exponentials past each other. Because suppose you have two, you have two R matrices. <coughs> these are very nicely ordered, so this is the O of something, and this is also the O of something else. But now what if I do, if I do this? then we are supposed to read, from the definition of the universal invariant, we're supposed to read whatever we see along the line. And so here we have a nice order CUW, but here we also have a CUW order. And so now we get a clash between orders, and I actually wrote it incorrectly. But so this, what is the purpose of this logos is just to um, change the order in So there's this joke, you have two cows, and you make one cow. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in Dutch, this is actually ku, which is phonetically quite correct. So you have to, this is inverse van Achtersky, you have two, two cows, you make one. And for that, you need something very fancy, you need the principle of the universe. And that's this five-line uh, polynomial. Um, but so, let's not stare at it too, but let, let's go briefly to this lemma one. And th this lemma one is a complete implementation of this problem, of this problem where you, you want to stitch R matrices together or tangles together to build a knot. And so what you have to do is you have to deal with these things, but not just the uh, ordinary letters in the Hopf algebra, but, but at the level of exponentials. So we want to do things like e to the u and this is actually not so hard. This is this uh, is it called Heisenberg? Here we just get the commutator of u and w. It's the same. It's the same. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's true though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but what are the indices? One, two, or up there? Well, for, for, for this discussion, I don't really need no, indices. No, in the, in the upper line. It's just number. Well, uh, so the indices came from that I have some component one here and a component two here, and then at first they are not connected. Okay, but when you connect them, they, they are in the same algebra, so I, I should really uh, I okay. just erase them. But the indices are useful for keeping track of the order. And and so, but but then we have to deal with them in one algebra, and then we have to reorder. And that's that's the that's the name of the game. And well, this game is surprisingly well. At, at the same, for the computer, it's very easy. For for humans, it's maybe harder. But so, so this lemma one does everything for you. And maybe rather than reading all the formulas, I, ca I can uh, just point you to this is a generalization of this O thing, and you should pay attention to it. In the lemma. It says things like here you have something, and then here it says C U W C U W. And there are two bold letters, and the bold letters are the process of the ch changing this into CW. So I change these two. Now I should change U and C, maybe. And then finally, I should change W and U. 
you get C C U U U W W. Right, and then, then we can merge the C's and the U's to get C U. So there are three steps necessary, and this, these are the three points in the lemma. And the middle step involves this logos polynomial, and this is the, the reason why it's not so easy to generalize this to three. It's definitely possible, but it would involve a better understanding of this logos. And I, I think that that's an interesting object here. And uh, it, it looks complicated, but at the very end you see there is actually a program here. And so I'll just end by saying that this is expected runtime number of crossings so that's polynomial time um, but it's still a 7 so that's not, not as good as the Alexander polynomial but this is a stronger invariant that could be computed for many knots so we'll give maybe some interesting supplements to the many experiments we have been doing in Foyum conjectures and other conjectures about the color Jones polynomial. So I think this is a good time to stop, but I should note that this is only the beginning. Right? There, are many, there are many things. Maybe I can write down the, the invariant of the trefoil. That's maybe a nice, nice ending. So this is uh, Z2, 3, 1. There you see some some of its features. So delta is the, the trefoil Alexander polynomial, right? So this is uh, T, maybe uh, over plus here, and maybe over T. So there's, there's still some choices here in normalization. So this is a plus, plus there are three terms. And it's a minus actually, minus two. I don't know where, where I wrote t minus one, but. for the whole, whole Rawson table, but... Um, so the, the Q of your theorem is just zero? So T... The Q of your theorem is just zero? No, T is... Q of my theorem... Do you have a theorem in the handout. The theorem uh, says uh, that there's an exponential term um, e to the Q. You're and absolutely right. So what I'm writing down here is only the P. So P, this is P. Oh, this is P? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is the P part of... Yeah. Excuse me. The point is that the, t the Q term is the same as the Q term for Z1, so that's why it's, it's not so interesting. But so this is the P part yeah. of Z2. Yeah, thank you very much. Otherwise, this doesn't make any sense. But so this is the perturbation. Um, and so this, this is the new stuff that comes out. So when you say quadratic, you mean at most, not a quadratic form, but just to be smaller. Quadratic. I mean quadratic for Q, right? Quadratic, quadratic. No, you call P quadratic for Q. No, quartic, quartic, quartic. Yes, but you use the word quadratic and quartic. You don't mean quadratic forms. Therefore, quadratic No, I just mean degree four, at most four. At most four. So it's not homogeneous. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's kind of surprising that it, it has only a C and a U W. So there, there, there could be a U square for all we know. Or, but that could, that could be. I mean, this, this P is better than, than quartic, right? This, this is only a quadratic P. Well, it's, it's degree 2 in, in U, C, W. So there, there are some surprising things. There are also some Alexander polynomials all, pretty much all over the place. But there are also slightly new things. And uh, yeah, I think this is a good time to end. Thank you very much. It's really the, the Gaussian term, and then the perturbations will get stronger and stronger depending on how what, how big n is. 
and you, yes, the, and the, the, the same is true for this constant term. This constant term will also be always one over Alexander. I expect that, at least for n equals two. So this, I, I really mean one but, over n. But you don't know that the theorem is true for bigger n. Right, I know very little about bigger n. No, I'm just asking if the theorem is true, not, not how to compute it. Um, in other words, is there a universal p1, p2, and you get 1 plus epsilon p1 plus epsilon squared p2? Or do you just only know the first? Okay. I, I think so, but I have no, I have no theorem, no. But, but there, are, there, are, there are reasons to think that. If you, if you think about the Konchevich integral, then, then there, is, there is some reason to think about this. Um, but no, no, I, I should say no. I, I know very little of past n equals 2 so far. So yes? So the two loop invariant is a well, rational function or polynomial in t. Yeah, it should be but in it's here. one polynomial in t. And, yes. And, and there I see three. But it, it could very well be that, that this one and this one are sort of following from, from this one. I'm, I'm hope. Or, or maybe there, there's another way of twisting it or presenting it. Um, but you're, you're, you're right that there, there, there seem to be three polynomials where we only were hoping for, for one. For one, yes. So, so there, there should be dependence. And this was one reason for computing many examples to see if, if there was some dependence. But so far, um, well, there, there, there's some clear patterns. There's always this t plus one or t minus one coming up. But it's, it's too early to say. But I, I agree with you that it, it should not. It should, there should be only one. Why yeah. Really Isn't it better to have more invariance? Yeah, but they, they may, if I know this, they, they, this may fall off from, from some, from some um, argument. Yes? Where do you need it to n equals 0? Where do you need that epsilon to the n equals 0? Um, improving lemma 1. So lemma 1. Um, and and most, mostly in, in the, the second part of lemma 1. But uh, in, in some sense, you don't need it. Um, but it, it just simplifies matters a lot. Because if, if you think about commuting these exponentials past each other, these are ordered exponentials. So, so, so what this really means is um, going to write them as power series, but I, I, I think that's, that's pointless. Well, what, what, the reason I, I, need, I need some null potency is that I can, I can really um, sum the geometric series still, and, then, and, and some derivatives of the geometric series. I think that, that's one way of saying it. And so if you didn't have that, then, then you wouldn't get it. So, so what, for, for example, if I, if I write uh, the, the Q exponential, um, I don't know, a n, then, then usually, usually this is this is not so. Well, it is just what it is. But, but now, now we can write it as um, the usual exponential, and then some perturbation, and, and then we can use the usual exponentials, which I yeah. But that is true. You uh, Yeah. So maybe I'm I'm just slow. I'm I'm hopeful, but. Um, well, again, this log logos thing came from commuting uh, these exponentials. That, that seems to get out of hand a bit. In, but maybe, again, this is because I'm using the wrong basis or the wrong viewpoint. Um, it's, it's definitely possible and tantalizing to see if, if it goes all the way. Yes? I thought Drawer's method, at the end of the day, for one knot, produces a rational function in one value. So the, the so rational, rational became Laurent. Yeah, Laurent. Yeah, it doesn't matter. But the what denominator the, is known, so you can get it wrong. But you yeah. still get three. Well, so so we both wrote a program and um, from different, from slightly different algebras, slightly different perspectives. And so actually, for the trefoil and for the almost we computed, it, they, they do coincide. So that, that there must be some uniqueness of the R matrix. So so the invariant so, so draw also gets three. Well, um, so I, I, I wrote a link to his um, to his website where you can see his program, so you can run it for yourself. Uh, but it, that's very interesting, I think, and and it's definitely not the, the not the, the final product. There's, there should be something here, and maybe it's related to the this remark about the center. But it's at least unclear to me what is the center. Of this. Um, 
algebra. That, that would probably help. <coughs> yes. Yesterday we installed those magic programs that worked for things with up to 24 tetrahedra. You complained that that's not really computable because after all there might be 100. Yes, I was trying to promote my own talk. Now you it was very selfish. you said tomorrow I'll show you something that really is computable. Now you seem to say you can only do the treffer. <laughs> so that's, yeah, he can do billions. Yes, but that's... That's quite good, right? Okay. Well, I don't know, but he can do billions and you can only do one. So um, well, I, I, did one, I, I wrote one on the board, but I have a computer program, so that can do billions too. It, it can, it has. Uh, well, I did Everything not do can if you, let it, if you let it run for billions of years. The question is whether it actually works. It, it actually works, and I, so far I computed for the Wolfson table, just because that, that was in my, in my reach. And, but it, it, any break presentation, so, so you're, you're welcome to, to give me your favorite break, and then, then we can hit end. So, so what if, if you could just take a knot with uh, 10 crossings, then you actually get an answer? Yes. For a finite amount of time? Yes. 20 seconds or so. My, my computer is old. But, but yes, and I'm, I'm happy to demonstrate if, if you want to show it. I, 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 no, I can show you. just said triumphantly that you and, and Rohr both computed for the trap only about the same things, if that was sort of the limit. Well, this was the first thing, so no, that was did, that was did exciting. Did he also do say something with his program with ten rows? I same think so, I think so, but he, he didn't implement the inputting a knot automatically. So and I did so. But but yes, I, I I think I think there's this theorem that if you have an R matrix, then no matter how you, how you twist it, it's going to give only one invariant. So really, this bound number of crosses to the seven is fiction. Maybe. I mean, in practice, it's not that. It's not 10 to the 7. It's so, so, the seven. If, so if you have Alexander, then, then you would do... So Alexander would be number of crossings to the 4, right? So, so this, is, this is worse than Alexander, but still pretty good, mm. I think. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a... So, so, so to me, I, I'm... Honestly, I don't care so much about computation, but I, I think I think this is a philosophical point that it's 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 it, it is not an exponential runtime. So, it, so this this must be a simpler object than than the objects like the Paula Jones point number. But, but, and and so it, it may be worth studying uh, what exactly the runtime is. But it, it it just shows that it is a different way of thinking about knots. So it's polynomial for any n, for any n. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm happy to demonstrate. If, and you can give me a break, and I, I, will, I will compute it. And, and how the exponent grows with n? Wait, wait, wait. So, so the number of crossings to the seven? No, no, for the n. Oh, 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 oh. So, sorry. So far, I, I, I was only able to do n equals so, But for, for any n, it is a polynomial, right? I expect so, but I have not. Uh, because again, um, it was sort of painful to derive these log logos correctly. So I derived it 10 times or so, and 10 times it was wrong, and I checked it with the computer and sort of merged all the mistakes and got something that actually ran. Experimental mathematics. But there should be a better proof, it's just that I'm not very good at it. No more questions? So thank you to the speaker. The next talk will start 11.30.